Uh, welcome to the podcast. Today's guest is Jimmy Hibbard. Jimmy, welcome. Hi, how you doing? Yeah, good, thank you, mate. How are you getting on in this lockdown period? Well, yeah, uh, it's hard work, but yeah, uh, it's one of those uh, situations where we've been put in and we can't do nothing about it apart from just staying in, staying indoors, staying safe uh, and doing what the government tell us for now. There's plenty of people yeah. out there that are going to get caught. Uh, just, I just think of it this way, mate. You look at a barbell angler. They have a closed season from March until June and it's just basically like that. It's like the old time yeah. going back, you know. Yeah, 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 no, definitely, mate. Um, just sitting tight, yeah, close season, just sit like that. I completely agree with you. Right, for those that don't know too much about you, if you give us a bit of background, Jimmy, who you are and what you're up to, please, mate. So, yeah, uh, so basically, uh, I've been fishing now, Pop. Uh, I've, been fish- I've been fishing since I was eight years old from uh, my granddad took me years ago. Uh, I was down, we used to fish a little council pond, uh, which was literally... 20 minutes away from my house so yeah we used to go down there with him and then from that obviously it stemmed into cat fishing i went through uh my teenage years catching all the cat fishing on the cat fishing scene catching uh plenty of fish out of this council pond and then eventually moving on onto the big fish scene and then obviously going around targeting carp uh from certain areas especially when i got me uh obviously test past the car so it freed me up a little bit and then from that mm-hmm. in Basically, from there, I worked in the retail world straight away. Uh, worked for a company called, well, your big company Next, for many years as a warehouse operative. Then I went into a managerial role. And basically, about eight years ago, uh, I went to work for, went into the trade and went to work for a fishing company called Chapman's Angling. I don't know, well, a lot of people know about it. It's an oven shop, which we had two shops. Uh, and then yeah. last year, uh, they got bought out by Angling Direct. So for, for the last... 12 months I've been working for Angling Direct as a retail assistant. Uh, many people know me because I travel around the shops as well. So I don't just work in, in one shop. I'll, I work in five or six of the northern ones. I am based in the Scunthorpe branch, but I spend a lot of time like say, going around the northern shops and just like you say, just keeping on top of them, covering, helping, supporting them shops. Yeah, no, nice. And that um, keeps you busy, I imagine, as well. So when you're travelling around to different shops... What's your role there? Is it just more sort of like overseeing or are you sort of hands-on or how does that work? I'm basically hands-on. Uh, before Christmas, I was lucky enough to be put in a position where I could go out there and help them rebuild the shops. We had two or three shops where we was we were reopening them. Uh, so basically, I was going in there, checking stock, laying it out, merchandising them uh, and basically doing little bits like that, which I got to see, obviously, how our shop from start to finish, from buying it, like getting a an empty shell into mm-hmm. something that's you look at some of our shops there that that the, the really stunning shops in our fairness you've got the, the marketing well not marketing but the 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 actual the layout of the shops are fantastic so it was a nice part of doing that but before that uh just going around the shops basically when a member of staff was off uh i was just going there helping them cover it really right but it basically got me around so it basically got me around because my ideal was, the shop that I work in at the minute, we've got a, a high amount of numbers where we've got really good staff. Well, really good staff. Uh, so getting a managerial position throughout that was hard work. So basically, I wanted to get upgrade. Well, basically, you know my career, upgrade my career and get into the mm-hmm. management side of things. So basically, that helped me go around a little bit of training here, there, and everywhere. Got to know the systems, got to know the staff, and then if they're an available job, it gave me that option of. Because of where I was, where I'm based, I'm I'm 20 minutes away from quite a lot of shops. Right. So it gives me the option if there's a job come up that I could go to these shops, apply for it, and maybe hopefully get that job as a managerial role. So yeah, so I'm basically trying to boost my career up. Yeah, oh, brilliant. That sounds good, mate. Um, all right, let's move on to your fishing where are you sort of currently fishing if you can mention it if not that's fine but maybe sort of talk a bit about that and then if you've got any uh, memorable catch stories you know they always go down really well so if you go on from that yeah so at the minute i'm fishing a 30 acre pit in lincoln a lot of people know about uh, well a lot of people know of it it's called the foundry uh right. it's it's a mega venue in all fairness uh it's got the likes of lewis porter jim wilson on there you've probably seen some of the fish on Lewis Porter's blog, uh, and it's an epic. Basically, it's epic. You've got quite a number of big fish in there. There's possibly hundred plus thirties. 
20 plus 40 is in there. And last year it did its first uh, 50. So yeah, it was. It's one of them waters where I got the ticket four years ago, and I'm not really in much of a rush to be. Well, before obviously before I joined uh, the foundry, Matt, I did a lot of target fish. I used to pick a fish, mm -hmm. basically go obviously just go basically fish flat fish until I've physically caught it. You know, put all my effort, all my time, all my in one right. basket until I have this certain fish in me uh, in my mm -hmm. fishing album. But with the foundry, because it's got so many big fish and some awesome looking fish as well, it's one of the right. places where I didn't want to be rushing around. I, I just took my time. I, because of the situation that I'm in now where I'm a full-time dad, uh, I still uh, I have my daughter full-time. I uh, work as well 40 hours a week. So mm -hmm. I haven't got the time now to just physically go, right, I can spend three to four nights trying to catch this one fish. So basically, I'm, I'm doing it because I can catch, I can still enjoy my fishing as well as catch yeah. big fish and also target fish what are in there. But it's just mm -hmm. I've got a longer period of time to catch them in now because there's that many of them. Yeah, yeah, no, nice. So how does that affect obviously your fishing? Being a full time dad, are you? I take it your time is very precious on uh, on limited on the bank. It, it is to be fair, and a lot of people. I still manage. To, if I get the balance right, I still manage to get two nights a week in, even if it's mm -hmm. uh, an overnighter or I've got a day between work where I can do an overnighter, a full day on the lake, an overnight, and then sh straight to work the next day type of thing. I right. still try and get there. I'm in a lucky position where my dad, uh, he helps me quite a lot with her. Gosh, uh, my mm -hmm. daughter doesn't see her mum that often. Uh, I, I don't get much support in regards to obviously just shipping her off here, there, and everywhere. So I spend quite a lot of time with her yeah. so i'm in a lucky position where my dad he's my dad's don't work he's retired now so he just loves spending time with her so when i haven't got oh when i need a little bit of a break because he knows how big my fishing is and how much dedication i've got to my fishing he's mm. happily to say right i'll take him plus she's got <laughs> she's got a big obsession with horses so she's into her horse riding right so and then obviously my dad takes her with that he's got his own yard and my auntie has her own horses and so forth so it it's, I've got a decent, I fell lucky yeah. uh, with having a good balance with it, if you know what I mean. It's just, especially, obviously, because she's five, but we're still, the good thing about it is, I'm not one of these people what just, I used to be a very, very selfish person in regards to, I just want to go fishing, I just want to go fishing. It was just one of those, mm -hmm. because I'm obsessed with it, it was drilled into me, just, I've got to go, I've got to go. But Obviously, with having her a year, well, I've had her a year now. She's lived with me for a year. And it really opened my eyes to think that how selfish I have been over the years. Yeah. So, but now, basically, I still get days out. We have every Sunday, well, every so many Sundays where I'm not working, that's her day. So we go out there, we'll do something. If it, if it means going to a wildlife park or long walks, anything to entertain her, really. And she loves it. You know what I mean? She even goes fishing with me as well. Uh Believe it or not, she's actually believe it or not, she's actually caught a twenty pound fish, which is crazy. <laughs> but that's what you get. You give her, yeah, I take that rod, and she had it. Yeah, it was fun. Experience, <laughs> but no, she has caught one, and she yes, yeah, she loves being outdoors. She's a bit like me. She's an outdoorsy type person. Yeah. So yeah, it all fits well, mate. To be fair, and oh, brilliant. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, it sounds like you've got it spot on in terms of balance. Fair oh, play, because it's mate. I'd imagine it's not an easy thing to do, is it? Oh no. Well, Obviously, the first, when I first got old, when, when she first started living with me, it was really hard work because obviously I've been used to having my own space. I used to have her on a weekend because me and her mum split up. But then mm -hmm. I full time and the stresses of other stuff, it were like, uh, I used to I'd just worry if she were all right. I used to worry about the biggest thing we're getting into school because she lived 10 miles away from me. I had to transfer her from a nursery, bring her into the village that I live in, and, mm -hmm. and then basically try and get her into a school really late on. So obviously right. the, stress, the stress of that really got to me, uh, and it was just because. Well, the stress of that got to me. The the stress of her actually going to school when we got there because she didn't know anybody. She was really upset, and mm -hmm. the knock on effect for that with me is I don't know. A lot of people have, have, have probably seen it on the pictures and stuff. I lost my hair. I got alopecia. Right. The stress of hair fell out. Uh, I used to have a, a really thick black beard. It was awesome. Now it's silver. I look like Father Christmas. Uh, so, and that's all because not because of the stress of having her it was more the stress of worrying make it yeah, want, no. wanting to make her happy 
Mm. Do you know what I mean? So that's the one thing I've always wanted to do. Obviously, I've always put myself first, but because she's now there, she's my number one priority, and she needs to be happy. That's all I'm bothered about. Yeah, no, nice, mate. That's um, definitely you got your priorities the right way around, which is refreshing to hear. Definitely. Um, if we obviously you mentioned you um, your style of angling that previously was going after target fish. Have you got any that particular stand out that you can give us a bit of background and a bit of a story to? Yeah, to be fair, I've uh, I've caught so I've caught a lot of northern fish in general, but the, in all fairness, it was the year of two thousand and twelve where I fished the Warpath, which really opened my eyes, and there were. Uh, it was one of them. I, I took myself out of my comfort zone, which in the north, mm-hmm. and went and took myself on a lake, which was, like you said, I don't know if people have heard about the wolf pack, and it's really scaly old carp that are in there and how hard it is. And I wanted to catch a fish called the linear, the big linear, which was in Lake Seven, I believe. And uh, right. yeah, going back to that year in 2012, it's probably that story about catching that, because obviously in that year, I also caught another special fish, which wasn't on my radar as such to start with, but mm. after, obviously after fishing the lake and catching the linear so quickly, it then went on to catching this thread, which was a, a really unknown common, which well basically didn't get caught. For, I caught it. I'll basically tell the story. So back in 2012, I started fishing the wall pack out of my comfort zone. I started in the spring, so I, I got down early in the March and... Uh, well, on my first session, I, I, I got down the lake, had a lap round, a couple of laps, found some fish fizzing, showing as well down in a swim called the Tats. Uh, and then, lo and behold, the next person, so I, I'm just going from basically being in the north, seeing nobody, you know what I mean, no big carp anglers' names and stuff like that, to then looking behind my shoulder and you've got Jim Shelley walking past me in the next swim, do you know? Uh, you've got <laughs> people like that and you've got, like, I say, Mark Hogg, it and people like that so so basically i'm i'm feeling proper under pressure now thinking wow the, these guys are serious carp anglers and i've shut myself off the depth here but yeah just to cut a long story short i blanked that session but i learned mm. a lot from it you know because obviously talking to jim jim as, as much as obviously people have views on jim jim is a nice guy and he'll happily help anybody and mm-hmm. one of the things he did help me is he helped me with a little bit about the fish and this, that, and other. So I took that on board and then basically got into it. You know what I mean? I was doing, I was doing three to four nights a week. I was in a position where when I was working at Next, I worked 36 hours. So I worked a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday. So every Sunday night, I was able to get on the A1, straight down to Cambridge, and obviously get down there for four nights a week or three nights a week, depending on if I had things to do midweek. So, yeah. yeah. With this time, I used it really well. So, obviously, I'd see this picture of this linear, this big linear. It's a prehistoric thing. And, uh, yeah, so I managed to get down to the lake, do a few sessions. I managed to catch a few of the stockies. I managed to catch a nice scaly fish within a few weeks of starting. But when it got to the end of March, beginning of April, the lake, the lake really woke up. Hmm. And, obviously... I were in a lucky position where when I was turning up on the Sunday or the Monday morning, there were hardly any anglers there, so I had the pick of the run. I had the pick of the run basically. If I ever saw a fish, I would be able to be the first first guy on it, and so forth. So yeah, so obviously I've got into fishing. I've got into fishing, obviously the wall pack now, and I've been mooching about. And the, the, there's an area on the lake where the linear used to get caught early doors, in a swim called the Elephant, which is like. If people know it, it's halfway up the bank between the five, six, uh, seven and six split bank. And it's a really good swim. Anyway, so a couple of story short, I found myself in this swim because of all the fizzing and so forth going along. And uh, yeah, uh, throughout that night, I got, a, I got a take. I had a common start off with, and then the Evans opened. I mean, it was proper carpy weather turned up. Nice southwesterly wind, low pressure coming. Uh, it was just ideal. But the following morning, I woke up, I thought, oh, I, I would try fishing chods as well. Just easy chods, throwing stick bait of it. I want anything, I want overcomplicating things. All I was doing is, mm-hmm. because my style of angling is mobility as well. Do you know what I mean? I'm a very mobile angler. I look for location. Obviously, the most important thing is the location in carp fishing, my, in my opinion, anyway. Uh, yeah. So, obviously, yeah. So I'm chucking these chods about, and I've, I've obviously. I've seen this fizzing coming out. I'm on this swimming tats, and I'm thinking, 
in the elephant. And I've, I've seen this fizzing to my left hand side in this 50 50 walk between another swim, but it, it, they seem to have loved this area. So I started to concentrate on it, obviously putting a little bait in as well. And then the following week, I went got back into it with this obviously carpet weather. We're going back into this carpet weather, I had this fish, blah, de, blah. And then uh, throughout that set, throughout that session, that it just got better and better. Low pressure, loads of rain, and it's got a tendency to flood this place. So obviously, the, the waters, the water, and the rivers are rising, and we're getting told that within a few, maybe in the next week, this, this is going to blow. It's banks type of thing. So I'm thinking, no, no, I need, get this, I need to get this carp caught because well, I need to catch something. Oh, my spring's going to be really, it's going to go. Do you know what I mean? Because obviously, if it yeah. floods, the water goes in there, it's going to make it hard fishing for quite a while. But luckily enough, they the, obviously I'm in this. I'm, I'm sat in my bivy one morning, laid there in my bag. I got up early to wake up the first light, and they were like, it would, it would, it were, it were proper sodden. It were, it were raining. It were coming down. It were bucketing. And I laid there and I thought, oh, I'm going to ring my mate. So I rings my mate. I'm laid in my bed, and, and he's telling me, oh, you need to get out there. You know what I mean? Keep keep looking out for him. You need to move if you need to move. And I'm like, well, I'm not. I'm I'm nice and cozy type of thing. I'm going to go back to sleep. So, so like, like I do, I went, back, I went back to sleep. I'm laid there in my bag, just just tossed over, just turned over. Uh, and within minutes of me trying to shut my eyes, the middle rod, well, middle rod, the right rod is off. It's melting. And I'm thinking, whoa, this is it. Do you know what I mean? So I runs out fully, obviously, because of obviously uh, the excitement and the anticipation of the bite. I've, I've gone out there. We're nothing. I'm basically on. I've got a pair of box of shorts on, a t-shirt, and I'm playing in the in in the rain. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, and obviously it's it's it's, it's proper. Rat. It's rutting me. It's going all over the place. It's wiped out over two lines. It's going. Uh, then, but obviously, I get the better of this fish, and then it popped up to the surface, and then I saw obviously the, the prehistoric scales down its lateral line. It spinned over again, and then there's another set of scales, and I'm thinking, oh god, it's it's the one, like it's the one. <laughs> Lo and behold, yeah, puts it, gets the net under it, looks into it, and there it is. The uh, obviously the the wool pack, uh, Lake Seven linear, <laughs> which is like possibly I think it was my, I think it was only my third or fourth capture out of the lake time as well. So I, right. I'd fluked. In all fairness, looking at it, I'd fluked it, but. <laughs> It was there in the bottom of my net, and I don't, I don't look a gift horse in the mouth when it's there. Do you know what I mean? It's 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 happened for a reason, and yeah, I've gone and caught it. Thirty-seven pound, I think it does forty odd pound now, but it's a thirty-seven pound a prehistoric came to babe as they call them, and it was absolute. My was buzzing, absolutely buzzing. But the downside yeah. to it is that the self takes aren't the greatest on it because it was it were raining, it were horrible dark day. Uh, hmm. I didn't get the greatest of pictures. So, obviously, the memories are there, but the pictures, obviously, they, they, they unfortunately, the pictures aren't the greatest. But, like you say, the memories there. But from that, yeah. then it opened my eyes to the lake a little bit more. Because I caught that, I was like, oh, what do I... It, it was one of them. I caught the biggest in the lake. Which one do you want next type of thing? And then Andy, yeah. Andy, the, Andy, the, owner, Andy the owner is a, is, is, is a, is a good storyteller, and he... And he only took the lakes on himself a few years pre pre previous to me getting the ticket. So he didn't know exactly, still 100% what were in the lakes. But there was always a fish. But well, there were two fish, what they, they said that were in there, what resided in there. There was a an old, like, slate grey mirror, which had done possibly eight years without being caught. And then this fish called Fred, this really angry common. Uh, and again, that had done, I think, it had been out, Previous to the season that I were on there, I think six years or seven years since it had been caught. <laughs> so, yeah, it, 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 it was one of them type of thing. It were like, is it still there? And obviously, stories were there. Everyone had seen it. And I, what I wanted to do is basically see it for my own self before I could mm -hmm. say, right, I'm going to concentrate fishing on that. So, yeah. so the spring went, the, the venue did flood. So what we had to do is I had to step back a little bit. I had to come back up north. Fish up north for a number of months again until obviously uh, the water levels had resided, the fish, uh, the fishery was safe to fish again. And 
by the time that had happened, the next thing and the next breath, the carp had started spawning. So again, we're another two to three weeks off getting back down to the lakes. It was like, ah. But I eventually got back down to the lakes in like end of July, I think it was. And because of the the, the water, because of obviously the, the flood water that had come in, the lakes were had a real tingent brown to them. So it was hard to see fish and this, that, and other. But on my first lap round seven, uh, I went into this corner. And there's like a, there's, a, there's an area in, in this in this it's called the car park. So basically, as you come onto Lake Seven, there's an there's an area where you can climb a tree and get up well get up there and have a look down into this corner where the the kind of it's like a sun trap. So they get in there, and lo and behold, I'm looking in these reeds and I've seen the blinier, I've seen the long common, which is a 35 pound common. I've seen loads of other fish, and then I've seen this common moving, which is on par with with the size of the linear. It's as long as the linear, it's as wide as it. And I'd heard stories, of, obviously, about this thread and about its top lobe had a, I believe it's its top lobe of his tail. He's got a slight indentation out of it. It's took out slightly. Obviously, it's withered away within the years. And uh, as I'm looking down through this and I'm looking and this is this dark common, I'm like trying to look through, its, you know what I mean? I'm looking down trying to think, oh, is it, is it is that one? Is it that one? Then I noticed it was. Yeah, I could see this uh, notch out of its lobe of its tail. I'm thinking, I've never seen this one. And then for... For a few hours, I sat there, watched it, and I thought to myself, you know what? It's been that long since someone's caught it. I'm going to have a go for it on the top or a slow sinking method, you know, trying to get in there. So I've tried, so I've gone round, got my rods, got a little bit of bread on, I've gone round into these reeds. So I'm creeping through these reeds, and they're all there still. And literally, I could have been hook a duck, mate. I could have just popped it on its head, and 99% of the chance it would have took it. Well, anyway, hmm. to cut a long story short, so I've got into these reeds. I'm climbing through these reeds. And then all of a sudden, as I'm getting to the tip of it, and as I'm t getting to the tip, just about to lower this piece of bread on this carp's head, the, the reeds just collapsed. So I'm falling through. And a set of waders, you could just imagine it. Shh, reeds rattling everywhere. Fish just psh, bolting off, gone. Do you know what I mean? And I'm thinking, <laughs> uh, I found this fish, this, this, this real old, gnarly, Caught <laughs> common, and I've just basically knackered it up by falling through the reeds, crashing through these reeds. And yeah, so I give it another ten minutes, hoping that twenty minutes, hoping that they obviously come back into the zone. But with the fish being that old and wary, it was just no, they didn't come back. So on that note, I thought right, I had a lap round seven, and they were really moody. It was hard work, man, because of the water, because of the water clarity and stuff like that. No, I'm going to leave it. I, I I had a full lake complex, well, a full complex ticket, so I'm able to fish the other lakes on there. And five six is another get again. Five six is a lake with possibly only at the time there are only like sixteen fish in it. I think maybe mm -hmm. two more, maybe twenty at a push. So I thought because Lake Seven were looking a bit, uh, I thought oh, I'm going to have a walk around five six. So I'm looking around mm -hmm. five six. So I've gone around five and I've gone around six. And as I'm coming on to Lake. Uh, lake five there's like a little there's like two gaps so you can get through well there's, there's a gap either end where the fish can get through i've gone around the top so i'm at the top gap uh basically near lake four and i looked across the lake so it's a, it gives you a really good view of all of lake five as well so you can look from like all the way down it and halfway down it i could just see this it's it really minute fizzing but you could see it it's one of them where the summer on you know, on it perfectly. You could see these fish fizzing. So basically, mm -hmm. I've uh, I've run round to swim, and I've 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 looked out. Oh, they're there. I've measured it up where they've been fizzing. Run back round to the car. Got my gear. Come back round. Got the rods out. Chod it up again as you do. Fired these three chods out onto this fizzing area, and within ten minutes, I've got this bite. Oh, I'm, I'm rushing around. Oh, whoa, whoa! Catches it. Uh, plays this fish in. Lands it. It's a stocky. So there's a couple of stockies in there because obviously you've got to keep the, the balance of life going as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so I've, I think, oh, sweet, this is this is going to happen. I'm I'm, I'm confident. I've, I've gone on to the hardest lakes on the complex and I've caught one instantly. So I'm like mm -hmm. buzzing now, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm, I'm there setting up, rods back out there. I'm putting bait out now by this point because the fizzing, I thought, right, I'm going to keep them here. So I've put a couple of kilos of bait out and in that session, I've caught four fish, three stockies, obviously. But then hmm. I caught a fish called clover, which is a really rare common at 36. Absolutely. Right. 
Cam- uh, Cambridge of Babe again, big overslung mouth, nice little, basically we're on its uh, left hand side, it's got like a set of scales, what look, obviously called, looks like a clover, you know, like a four leaf clover, mm-hmm. so obviously that's why fish were called clover. So then obviously off the back of that session, I got really excited. But right, I'm going to, because cause I'm now brimming with confidence. Jim's also fishing Lake 5-6 as well. So obviously it's not, it's not easy because that man's an animal, you know. He's, he's, if, he's not, if he's not at one end of the lake, he's at the other. He's all over the place. So it's hard because he's already beat you to the fish before you've even seen him, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Cause yeah, but anyway, uh, I've, I've decided to continue fishing 5 and 6. And I've been catching a few regular, really regular. So I've, throughout the summer, I was catching one or two fish every couple of sessions you know again with it being hard you won't catch every week you will like you say you'll put piece in the puzzle together until one so i've gone out throughout the summer and it's got to september now and the lake's completely changed a lot harder lake five six uh, and then so basically i i thought to myself well i'm not gonna i'm gonna continue on here for another couple of weeks until something tells me to go somewhere else so I've set up in a swim called uh, I'm trying to think of its name now because it's, it's, it's years ago uh, it's like basically on the back side of the five on the bottom bank of a five six split uh, not on the five six so basically the bottom cut through into lake five from six I'm fishing the entrance to that and I've had a couple of fish but when you wake up I, I woke up one morning and it were like I had, this, I had this feeling to be. I had to be somewhere else, you know. I'm, 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 hmm. There were nothing showing. It's first light. I'm going to go for a mooch. So I reeled my rods in. Wrong time to reel my rods in, but I thought I reel them in now. I'm going for a mooch. So I've had a mooch around the lakes. I've gone into. I've gone into the first swim on Lake Seven on the five six bank, and at the seven. Sorry, mate. At the seven six split bank. In a swim, hmm. I walked into a swim called Thirties. A, a very famous swim called Thirties. It's got to be a lot of people fished it. I think it's, it, this fish rarely get, uh, regularly gets caught out of this area as well. Uh, so I've walked into there and I've immediately seen three fish show. One, two, three. I'm thinking, well, they're having it. There's no one on Lake Seven. They're having it. Do you know what I mean? As I'm walking out, the, as I'm walking out the swim, Jim's there. You've just seen them, haven't you? I'm going in there. It's like fair play, fair play, no worries. Do you know what I mean? And on that note, I've gone round, got my gear, come back into the swim. Uh, got my gear set, tied up some fresh choddies, and I've put these three choddies around an area uh, out where these fish had been showing. They start to fizz a little bit now as well. 10, 10, 20 minutes later, Jim pops around. He's seen them behind me, so he's set up behind me on Lake Six, and he's fishing in uh, in there in a swim called Tea Bags, and we're having a bit of a chit chat because obviously it's only literally ten yards away from each other when mm. the middle rods absolutely melted it's gone it's uh, normally with a chod i get a, you get a slow take a, a bobbin just lifts did, 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 and then mm. it, this thing did the bobbin just hit the top of the blank and it was away uh and <laughs> to be fair i'm lucky that i had my rod to be fair i'm lucky that i grabbed my rod because obviously it did one of the, I, I was fishing true style as well with rod's eye as you do when you're chodding as you do lines dripping down and so forth so the rod's there it's gone smashed against the buzzer as well so i've just basically caught this rod as it's going in <laughs> yeah so yeah i've hit i've hit the i've hit the rod and straight away i've known that this is do you know I, i've never in all the fish that i've upped in this lake because of, i believe because they're so they're so old they don't tend to give you a bit of a scrap they think oh i've just been upped again do you know what i mean it's one of them if i pull a bit back pull back i'm just gonna get more, yeah. nothing more pain but this one this one you, you could tell you could tell something were different within the battle it's stripping line it's, it's coming off the spool and uh and then the, the, the jim walks into the swim he says what you got i'm like i don't know at minute mate it's just like proper giving me it's rutting it's out in the middle i'm still 30 40 yards away from seeing what it is and it's still deep in the water so jim reels another rods in for me so it just helps out a little bit and then uh, as I gets into the water, I'm playing this fish. I'm keeping as it's coming in. And as it pops up into the, as it pops up, Jim's like, "What's what? What, what was that?" And we we both were both astonished. We didn't know what fish it was. It was a long, dark, common, overslug mouth. So this, as it comes in, it's it's took a gasp of air and it's straight in the net first time. Boom! Pull back, 
As I look into it, me and Jim are looking into the net. And we don't have a clue what this fish is. I'm like, the only other thing we can do is check its tail lobes. You know what I mean? It's got to be, it's got to be either one of the. It's got to be either Fred or it's a common that no one knows about. Do you know what I mean? So obviously we've got it out the mat. We've got it out, laid it on the mat. First thing I've done is, is when I've run up to it is I've laid its tail out and fanned it out. And then, lo and behold, on its back of its uh, lobe, there's this uh, little indentation out of it. And then, yeah, uh, hmm. out of I, I, can't, I, I lost for words at the time, but uh, as Andy, we, we got Andy, the owner, to come round just to clarify it. But yeah, uh, after six years of not being caught and being told, hmm. and this 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 is the funniest thing about it as well. I got told you won't catch it on a boilie, you won't catch hmm. it on a chod. And you won't catch it off the show. You're going to have to stalk it somehow. So I did the completely opposite of all of what it got caught on. I caught it on a chod, on a boilie, and on a show. So it was like, it was one of these things. <laughs> the, the funniest thing about it is, is that you can put a lot of effort into catching a carp. And you can put loads and loads of effort in. But if your name's on that carp, what I found, if your name's on that carp, you will catch it no mm. less than anything else. You will. It'll be there. If you're, if you're meant to catch that fish, you're meant to catch it. And I, and that obviously, I was in a lucky position. I fished the lakes with the, some of the best anglers in the country. Yeah. At the, you know what I mean? It, 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 it was great. The one biggest thing is, and I regret, is I never went back the following year because I found myself that the funniest thing is after catching Fred and seeing, my luck seemed to have changed. I was a single man. But when I caught Fred, seems funny enough, everything started to fit into fit into place again. Uh, I caught that life at home got better. I found myself a woman, and when I found myself a woman, the, the downside to it is I found myself a woman when I should have been really fishing the next year back for the for the other ones on. You know what I mean? But no, coming back to it, Fred, yeah, awesome capture of Fred. Uh, it's probably my most memorable capture, to be fair, and it's. Mm. And it's probably the one that stands out for me, where I got to meet some of the, some of the, the good anglers, some of the, the magazine guys. They say, I, like, say down there, I met people like Max Hendry down there, down Wild Boar, or Jim on there, uh, Mark Hogg, Jason Hendry fishing, I believe at the time. So yeah, there, there were quite a few great anglers, and it were, we used to have some good times down there. In fairness, and topping it off, catching Fred just really topped it all off. So yeah, it, 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 my most memorable catch is obviously Fred. So, yeah, yeah, brilliant, mate. That's an awesome story. I love that. So yeah, uh, there's a there's a few there's a few more stories I could tell you about the the Wolfpack, and uh, <laughs> I'll leave them for another time. <laughs> yeah, no, nice, mate. Nice. No, I like that. Um, what did the fish weigh in at in the end? It weighed at 30, 36 in the end, I believe it was. Yeah. So, obviously, when it come down, when we rattled all the pictures off. Uh, Jim got well. Jim went out. He got us a bottle of beer. We had a good celebration drink that night. Uh, yeah. And then the following morning, believe it or not, this was crazy. So the following morning, I've landed obviously Fred. So I'm on cloud nine. I've got the rods out. I'm a, but obviously that night I, we, we got a bit rough. So I'm 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 basically hanging out my ass in the bivvy the next morning at first light, thinking of <laughs> uh, you know, bit of a rough. I still got up. I got up to a one toner on the left hand rod. <laughs> so yeah, and then I goes out. Obviously, it's, it plays this fishing, gets this fishing, and slips this just shy of thirty pound fully scaled Cambridge uh, like <laughs> oh, I mean, it was a proper scale. Yeah, it was best fully one of the best fully scales I've caught in our fairness. Yeah, you know? and that just oh, wow. off the same, <laughs> fair. So it was like within within that. I think what happened is, mate, my luck had all lined up. The planets had aligned mm -hmm. and everything just fell into place at the time. And I think the effort of chasing them around all year, the effort of going down there, putting the time and travelling 120 miles there and, you know, finishing a, night yeah. shift, finishing a night shift and going straight down to Cambridge after a night shift and then not getting any sleep for all day up until you set up at night and, you, you know... I think mm. all that effort, and it, I'll always say this, effort always equals rewards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, mate. And that's hard as well for those. I've done night shifts before, 
that's it's you're absolutely hanging aren't you on that last night and that morning then the buzz obviously especially if you've got a long drive ahead of you as well that's going to make you even more tired yeah and then you're only really surviving on that buzz of going after those fish and say once the rods are out you're out for the count aren't you oh, yeah well the i I, sh- I wish I had a sponsorship with Red Bull back then, mate, because I didn't need it. Because, yeah, the amount of caffeine that I drank to stay awake and get down there was a- <laughs> was unbelievable. But, yeah, yeah, they were well worth the effort and the travel. Awesome, mate. That's a really good story. I enjoyed that, and I think all the listeners are going to love that one too. Um, what we do is, well, if we just quickly move on to um, the question that I, I- – sort of doing the um like a rotary style question so yours is is sort of two really and the first one is is, it's from lance barton it's um talking about peanuts obviously if you've got any experience with peanuts using them obviously because they were controversial but a brilliant carp bait um do you use them do you prepare them how do you how do you go about that me me personally i'm one of these people because i've got i haven't got much time i've not I've not used peanuts. I know they're deadly. Peanuts are absolutely deadly. I'm a tiger nut man over peanuts, to be fair. But mm-hmm. uh, peanuts are so deadly. But what I would do myself personally, because I've got no time, I haven't got time to spend hours preparing them and doing, you know what I mean? I ain't got time for that. What I do, I'd, if I were going to approach a water with peanuts or particle based baits like that, I'd possibly mm-hmm. go down the route of getting them buy them pre-done, get them mm-hmm. in a tin or something like that. Just, just so I know in the back of my mind I'm fishing safely with them. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. Yeah, and then just, uh, again, it's t- twofold, isn't it? The safety thing and the time thing. There's definitely, there's. I mean, I'm going to say I'm sort of quite time poor, so I'd probably do the same as you, mate. Just get them pre-prepared so you know they're safe and you can concentrate more on your fishing. There's plenty of people out there. There's plenty of particle companies what will happily do you anything nowadays. We've got that much range of stuff in carp fishing, you know, mm. got that much option. That, yeah, there's people doing them there. And I think, like you say, if you are time consumed, like me, yourself, yeah, I think the frenzied pre cooked way is the best. Yeah, no, definitely, mate. Great answer. And the other thing is, well, we sort of mentioned we, it's like a bit of a, a twofold question. What are your views on folded reel handles? Oh, uh, I'll uh, I'll be very yeah. I can't have a I can't have no opinion on them because I used to fold them myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, do you still do it now? I don't you know. No, my reels that I use now, they I can't fold. I, well, the, I use Shimano reels, so I haven't got no fold handles. But back back in the day when I used to use my tournaments and my SSs, yeah, to yeah. make the tie to the setup the more bites I actually got. <laughs> if you can make that, but no, uh, each their own, mate. In our opinion, I'm not gonna. It's not one of those things where it's going to change your angling, but if it makes you feel confident that you've got your real handles folded, if it's just a confidence thing or if it's a look good thing, we sit there for hours on with with mm. out there. It's make it look good, you know what I mean? So my opinion on it, if you want to do it, do it. It doesn't catch any more fish, but it looks stylish, let's be honest. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, and one last thing, Jimmy, before you go, I'm getting everyone to do... A uh, sixty-second sketch of a carp. Can you just like video it um, and then send, uh, take a picture and send it to me? I can do like a little mini fun competition in this lockdown period for everyone that enters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get me, I get myself, and I get my little girl to do one for you as well. Yeah, awesome, mate. Perfect. That'd be ideal. Um, yeah, and then just ping them across. Yeah, mate, not a problem. Anytime. Perfect. Awesome, Jimmy. Right, we're wrap up there. Thank you very much, mate. I really enjoyed that. Not a problem, mate. And thank you, Dom. And stay safe, mate. And everybody, stay indoors. It'll come. We'll be all back out there as quick as well. As long as we are staying indoors, we'll all be out there as quick as possible. Just ride, prep up, enjoy it, and stay safe. Thanks, Don, for having me. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Jimmy. Take care, mate. Hey, buddy, thank you, mate.